it's working. Stop, check. Right, that should be working now. Uh, well, welcome everyone to uh, the CNS Talks for 2022. Today we have Erin Hecht opening for us on uh, the evolution of dark anatomy and domesticated foxes. I'm quite excited about that. Erin's um, lab studies frame behavior evolution in dogs, primates and humans and Erin got her undergraduate in cognitive sciences, postgraduate in neurosciences, and in 2019, joined the Department of Human Evolutionary Biology at Harvard as a assistant professor. And she also has two dogs herself. And I just asked her what came first, the dogs or the topic of study. And actually the dogs came first. <laughs> right, without further ado, Erin, if you wanna take over. Um, I'll share my screen. Um, uh, thank you very much to Stephanie for um, the, the invitation. It's really nice to, to be invited and to have the opportunity to talk with you all today. Um, and yeah, thank you all for your interest. Um, I understand that we have a variety of different backgrounds in the um, audience, people from academia, from the veterinary world, maybe some dog owners that are just interested. So I'll try to kind of um, explain things in a way that's accessible to different backgrounds, but please feel free to jump in and interrupt with questions. Um, okay, so um, Darwin saw domestication as a, a window on how evolution works. Um, I like to think that um, some of his ideas about evolution might have been shaped by watching dogs. Some of his earliest writing about natural selection was actually about dogs. Um, he wrote about how uh, greyhounds seem to be supremely adapted for chasing and catching hares, uh, even before he published on the origin of species. And of course, he also wrote um, a, a multi-volume work on um, animals and plants under domestication, um, where he sort of examined domestication as um, a way to look at the results of known selection pressures on change across generations. So sort of following um, in that line of thinking, um, I've been looking at domesticated dogs and foxes um, as a way to understand how those selection pressures, particularly as they relate to behavior, influence the evolution of brain organization. Um, so I'll talk about three sets of studies today. Um, the first one is about what happens when you apply selection for tameness. Um, so this is about the Russian fox farm project. Um, the second um, studies that I'll talk about are about um, what happens when you apply selection pressure for breed specialized learned skills like hunting or herding. Um, and then the third study is about um, selection pressure for differences in general temperament, like differences in levels of anxiety or aggression or trainability. Um, okay, so starting out with a fox farm experiment, um, if, uh, if any of you have not heard of this experiment, um, I would strongly recommend doing a YouTube search. If you're having a bad day, um, watching videos of these tame foxes is like a surefire way to sort of brighten up your day. Um, they're sort of disgustingly cute. Um, so uh, this experiment started um, uh, and over 60 generations ago um, in Russia, um, there was a fur farm um, where um, an ethologist took over the breeding operation of um, these foxes and uh, started intentionally breeding together the foxes that were easiest to handle or sort of mo most tolerant of the human approach. Um, and then a little bit later, um, a separate strain of foxes started being selected for the opposite behavioral phenotype. So um, lack of tolerance to approach by a human. So now um, more than 50 generations later, there are three strains of foxes. There's a tame strain um, that reacts to unfamiliar humans um, in similar ways to domestic dogs. They like wag their tails, um, get really excited. Sometimes they seem so excited that they urinate. Um, and then uh, on the other hand, there's an aggressive strain that um, if humans approach, they uh, prefer to avoid human contact. And if that contact is forced, they respond with defensive aggression. 
Um, and then there's also a third strain of foxes that is kept on the farm, but without selection on any behavior. So this is sort of a baseline or control strain. Um, so those are referred to as the unselected or conventional foxes. Um, so there's been a lot of work um, on these foxes over the past few de decades. And a number of consequences of this selection re regime have been identified. Um, so um, there are, this selection has produced changes um, in the morphology of the animals, um, including like the coat pattern, potentially the skull shape, although there are conflicting results about that, um, ear shape and so forth. Um, these things are sort of grouped together um, into a concept called the domestication syndrome, which is this idea that um, selection for tameness produces correlated shifts in um, all of these sort of morphological traits across species. Um, this concept has sort of come under question lately um, and a, a finding from the Russian uh, fox farm experiment that is published only in Russian uh, that a lot of people don't know about is that um, these morphological changes actually happen in the aggressive foxes at similar rates um, as the tame foxes. So that'll become important a little bit later. There are of course also behavioral changes that result from this selection. Um, in addition to how the foxes behaviorally respond to an unfamiliar human, there are also shifts in um, how they perceive human communicative cues um, and how they vocalize to each other. Um, there are genetic changes. Um, these map on to the locus that is implicated in wolf to dog domestication. Um, so it kind of provides some support that um, similar genomic mechanisms are at play in domestication of these foxes and domestication of dogs. There are uh, differences in development, um, particularly with regard to when the social critical period appears and when the fear response um, appears in development. Um, there are also changes in different hormone and neuroendocrine systems. Um, and there have been a few findings about neural changes, um, but for the most part, um, people hadn't really been looking at what is different about the brain organization of these foxes in response to this selection on social behavior, which I found sort of mind boggling. Um, so uh, we were able to get um, brains from 30 foxes, so 10 from each of the three strains, uh, and we scanned them on a 9.4 Tesla MRI. So this is um, relevant because it lets you get really high resolution images, much higher resolution than is typical for human neuroimaging studies. So our resolution is um, 300 microns. That is um, about the width of a cortical column, just to give you a frame of reference. Um, so um, on this slide, um, I'm showing uh, what these images look like. Um, so uh, here we have a T2 weighted image. This is just like a structural MRI image. It shows basic brain anatomy. Um, and I've labeled a few different regions of the brain. And the important feature here is that you can see um, these really fine grained anatomical features that delineate the borders of um, small nuclei in the brain. So um, what we have here is a, um, a border between two amygdala nuclei, um, which is uh, commonly um, not visible in human MRI scans. Um, and then this is uh, an image produced by dividing a T2 weighted image divided by a T1 weighted image. Um, with, this gives you sort of a map of myelination in cortex. Um, and uh, you can see this stripe in primary visual cortex, area V1. So this is an area of increased myelin um, in the um, part of cortex that uh, receives visual information, which is important because um, this is something that's normally only visible with a microscope. So this is the stripe in striate cortex. Um, so when we acquired these MRI scans from um, all these different fox brains. The first thing we looked at was something which didn't require all of this really fancy high resolution imaging, which was just, are there differences in the size of uh, the brains across different strains of foxes? And this is relevant because um, in domestication research generally, shifts in brain size, reductions in brain size are um, the primary result that has come from studies on lots of different species um, across the animal kingdom but we did not see that here. Um, so tame foxes have more gray matter than the unselected or conventional fox strain, and also so do aggressive foxes. So both tame and aggressive foxes, both of the, the strains that experience this strong behavioral selection pressure have 
bigger brains. Um, so this is directly contradictory to um, prior research in other species about domestication. So what might be going on here? Um, so I have a few sort of um, loose ideas. Um, so one possibility might be that if you apply really, really steep, fast selection pressure on behavior, um, this might um, favor genomic variant, variants that lead to expression changes in genes that have pleiotropic effects elsewhere in the brain. So um, like maybe like a transcription factor. So this could be sort of a, a messy way for evolution to satisfy the selection problem that you're setting up for it. Um, so this could have um, effects in the brain region that's responsible or the circuit of brain regions that are responsible for the, the behavior that is under selection, but also effects in other regions. So this might um, sort of drag along expansion of other regions in the brain in addition to expansion um, of the regions that are actually producing the shift in behavior. So this is kind of related to this idea of developmental linkages um, that was elaborated by Barbara Frimley and her colleagues in the context of brain evolution. Um, so in the wild, these types of inefficient solutions that are sort of blowing up the brain in response to selection just on um, a limited number of regions, um, those would be maladaptive because they would be inefficient. Brain tissue is metabolically really expensive. Um, so in the wild where you aren't being provisioned by human caretakers, um, that, that type of enlargement might not have the opportunity to evolve. But in the fox farm program, the animals have all the calories they need. So this might be um, possible. Um, so what if we look beyond brain size? This is a map of variation um, in brain anatomy across the entire data set. So the um, yellow and green regions are more variable across individuals, um, and the purple regions are less variable across individuals. Um, and you can see that the variation occurs um, mainly in prefrontal cortex and in the hypothalamus. There's also a lot of variation in the cerebellum. Um, so um, uh, this, is, this is published in the Journal of Neuroscience now. It's no longer under review. Um, so we can take these maps of um, how much and where each brain varies from the group average and do statistics on that. So we did, we used two different approaches for that. One is called voxel-based morphometry. This is sort of a um, general linear model driven comparison where we say, uh, where are tame brains different from unselected brains or where are um, aggressive brains different from tame brains and so forth. So this figure shows um, comparisons between each pair of strains. And the sort of main take home point here, and I think somewhat of a surprising result is that regions of expansion in both the tame and aggressive strains as compared to the unselected strain are largely overlapping. So both the tame and aggressive boxes have expansion in prefrontal cortex, which is red here, um, the amygdala, which is green, hippocampus, which is purple, and then a couple of regions in the cerebellum, which are blue. Um, so this is um, maybe a little bit surprising um, because we have opposite behavioral selection, which has clearly resulted in opposite behavioral phenotypes, but parallel changes in the brain, at least at the level of gross morphology. Um, and uh, another thing that um, you might be wondering, or that I was wondering when I saw this result, is what about the hypothalamus? So if we think back to that map of variation across the entire data set, the hypothalamus showed um, a high degree of variation across the data set, but it's not showing up in any of these results. Um, so this suggests that variation in the hypothalamus might um, not parcel cleanly across the strains. Um, this is a model-driven analysis where we like, you know, explicitly put these different um, scans in different bins according to which strain each fox was from. But what if we forget about the strains and just um, do something that's more data-driven? So um, to do this, uh, we used an approach called, um, uh, well, a, a variant of um, independent components analysis um, called source-based morphometry. Um, so if you um, have ever uh, worked with like, um, five-factor personality data in humans, or maybe you've done behavioral research in animals where you do some sort of dimension reduction um, analysis. 
Um, this is sort of the same type of thing, but on um, imaging data. So we have lots of different variables, which are all of the different voxels in the brain. And we want to see how they cluster together in terms of covariation across individuals. Um, so we can identify um, regions of the brain that covary together, um, these sort of covariating networks. And then we can ask what um, potential correlates explain that variation. Um, so to do that, we use behavior scores from each individual box. So um, these behavioral scores were produced by Anna Kukakova and her lab. Um, so uh, in this behavior test, um, an unknown human approaches the fox in its home kennel in a sort of very um, controlled and regimented way. Um, and then a lot of different behavioral traits um, that the foxes can produce in response to this approach um, are documented. Things like whether the fox's ears are pinned back against its head or you know, oriented forwards towards the human, whether the fox is vocalizing its position in the kennel and so forth. So if you measure all of those different behavioral traits um, and do a PCA on it, you wind up with um, three primary dimensions of behavior that um, separate the um, phenotypes across strains. Um, so one of these is how close the fox is to the human in its kennel that um, really strongly separates the tame strain from the other two strains that's shown here. Um, the other, uh, the second component has to do with um, whether the fox is showing an active aggressive response like biting and snapping versus a sort of passive tolerance of contact. Um, and then the third um, component described neutral exploratory behavior versus um, being pro proximal to the human. So sort of exploring the cage versus being close to the human. Um, so we have these three sort of um, components of behavior that we can now attempt to map onto components of brain variation. Um, so that's what I'm showing here. Um, so this is a busy slide, but I'll walk you through it. Um, this first network in the brain, so these are, these are brain regions that co-vary predictably with each other across individuals in the data set. Um, the red and, or the purple, excuse me, orange and blue regions are anti-correlated with each other. So if blue tends to be larger, orange tends to be smaller and vice versa. So this first component um, contained regions of the thalamus, prefrontal cortex, and cerebellum, um, but factor loadings for this component did not separate um, across strains, did not separate foxes across strains, um, and we didn't see any significant relationship with individual behavior scores. The second and third components, though, did show significant differences across strains and also showed significant relationships with individual variation in behavior. So these two networks um, contain portions of the cerebellum, hypothalamus, and prefrontal cortex. Um, and an interesting thing here was that um, this third network, which includes most of the prefrontal cortex, um, scores on this component um, clustered together for both the tame and aggressive strains, um, which are shown here in orange and green. Um, and it differentiated them from the conventional strain, which is gray. Um, and this mapped onto um, behavior component two, um, which uh, describes active aggressive response versus passive tolerance of contact. Um, so we're, we're starting to see these differences in brain anatomy that um, in some cases separate the fox strains, but in other cases separate the selected strains from the um, unselected strain. And we also see relationships with individual variation in behavior, which kind of gives us some um, additional confidence that this is really causative, causatively related um, to behavioral variation across the strains. Um, so to summarize the fox findings so far, we're seeing increased gray matter volume in both the tame and aggressive foxes um, in partially overlapping regions. Um, Co-variation in gray matter anatomy wrap maps onto tame versus aggressive behavior, but some of this um, differentiates both of the selective strains together from the control strain. So where do we go from here? Um, in our next phases of the project, we're looking at um, development. So um, we're looking at how brains change during development, how this might correspond with shifts in critical periods in development. Um, and then we're also looking at protein level changes, um, and that work is being led by Christina Rogers-Flattery, who is a postdoc in my lab.
Um, so I'll pause for a moment in case anybody has questions about the fox work before I move on to dog stuff. I might have a quick question. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so you show a lot about uh, the changes in the cerebellum. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't have intuitively imagined changes in the cerebellum associated to domestication or aggression. And I may have missed it because I'm multitasking, but why the cerebellum? Yeah, uh, good question. So um, we were not uh, hypothesized, you know, we didn't really, we weren't looking for changes there. We didn't expect to see them there. We just did all of this work in a whole brain manner. Um, and I think it makes sense if you keep in mind that the cerebellum and cerebrum co-evolve um, and probably have some developmental linkages. They clearly have, uh, you know, they're linked by these complex um, redundant networks um, in terms of connectivity. So if you have selection on um, a cerebral network or a particular cortical region that could produce um, or perhaps even be caused by changes in um, the cerebellum. So this, this finding of coevolution between cerebellum and cerebrum is something that holds across species generally from birds to mammals. Great, thank you. And a quick second question, if I may. Um, so we're talking about foxes, right? And domesticated foxes. When we talk about domesticated foxes, are they as domesticated as dogs or they kind of interact with humans, but they, they don't start to cuddle or follow you around, those kind of things, like which? which uh, yeah, good question. Um, so they absolutely would cuddle, um, is my understanding. I've never met one. Um, my impression is that they, they want nothing more than, you know, to experience human contact. Um, but uh, the Russian fox forum experiment, I don't think there's any way in which we can argue that it's a perfect correlate of domestication of dogs from wolves. So um, in the fox farm experiment, there was selection pressure applied very specifically on one dimension of behavior. Um, selection pressure wasn't put on any other aspects of the organism, like its um, anatomy or appearance or size or metabolism or anything like that. Um, we know that all of those other selection pressures have occurred in dogs. Um, and there's probably selection pressure behaviorally in dogs on more than just how they respond to an unknown human. Um, so yeah, I don't think foxes are recapitulating dog domestication, but they do give us a really clean window on what happens if you apply selection pressure against um, this sort of social avoidance response to an unknown human. Great, thank you. Uh, Valentina also has a question. Yes, a quick one. Um, I was wondering uh, how these um, anatomical results uh, um, resu could uh, explain or uh, reflect uh, differences in the behavior of the, of the different animals and especially in the social behavior of the animals. Yeah, so the brain regions that we see implicated here, amygdala, hippocampus, prefrontal cortex, hypothalamus, and particular regions of the cerebellum, are all involved in social behavior. Um, they're involved both in aggressive social behavior, but also in social bonding um, and like evaluation of social signals. Um, so in terms of like exactly what has changed, I think we need to get down to um, the cellular level and you know, look at uh, gene expression and to, in order to understand whether you know, maybe there's a particular type of neuron in a particular amygdala nucleus or hypothalamus nucleus that um, is upregulating a particular protein or, you know, the, the proportion of that neuron is reduced um, or something like that. Um, so I think in order to have a really mechanistic explanation, we need to dive deeper. But um, yeah, it, on a general level, these circuits control social behavior. But um, do they have uh, some particular advantages in, uh, in the social behavior uh, or what's the difference between the species? Um, there so some. Like uh, yeah, so um, in, for example, um, this prefrontal region that, that we see that um, is enlarged in both the tame and aggressive foxes. Um, if you look across carnivore species, um, that region, the prorian gyrus, becomes larger um, around the time that pack hunting evolves. So it's thought that the prorian gyrus might support sort of maybe some aspects of so social cognition that are important for interacting in a, in a social group. Um, 
Also, some of the regions that we um, see affected in cortex are active in dog fMRI experiments when dogs see or hear humans or other dogs. So probably something to do with, you know, um, understanding social signals, perhaps attention and sort of motivation to, to attend to social signals. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, we just triggered a bunch of questions over on YouTube as well. Um, and one that I would like to throw in before we're moving on is uh, from Simona Rossi, who wants to add to my question. Um, do these domesticated foxes learn how to obey orders? For example, would they be used as sheep foxes or to assist with uh, people with disabilities? Ah, that is a great question. Um... I would guess that train. So again, I haven't I haven't met these foxes, um, and they're they're kept in a sort of you know um, uh, not in the same type of environment that domestic dogs are kept in. Um, for for the purpose of this experimental evolution project, they keep the environment for the all the different strains very consistent, and they have minimal interaction with humans outside the context of experimental measurement of behavior. Um, so all that being said. Um, I would guess that it would be difficult to train a fox to herd sheep. Um, they don't have the same, I don't think they would have the same sort of predi you know, ancestral predatory patterns that um, dogs are using when they're um, herding sheep. Although, you know, maybe they might. Um, yeah, good question. Yeah, so far no, nobody's, you know, tried to do anything like that. Um, uh, another problem with keeping them in the house is that uh, my understanding is that they, they have not uh, manage to potty train them. They, they don't, um, yeah, they, they like to urine mark everywhere. Um, so that, that would be a challenge too. <laughs> Thank you. That's all the questions I can see at the moment. Okay, I'll forge ahead then. Um, so moving on to dogs, um, first I'll talk about uh, uh, response in the brain to selection on breed specialized skills like hunting and herding and guarding. Um, so, of course, uh, we know that different breeds of dogs are specialized for different sort of functions. Um, these can be, uh, have some really sort of stark, well-controlled differences. Like, um, for example, border collies use modified predatory behavior to herd sheep. Um, and livestock guardian dogs um, show conspecific behavior towards sheep. Um, they, they might submit to sheep or even attempt to mate with them. And the sheep is sort of their pack. Um, so the same, same sort of stimulus, livestock animals, very different sets of behavior in response to that stimulus. Um, and then we have um, hunting dogs that have been selected to hunt by sight or by smell. And then there are also um, other breeds of dogs. On your lap and cuddle all day or um, being, uh, really fighty and wanting to, you know, engage in um, aggressive contact with other dogs or with unfamiliar humans. Um, so we've got these really clear differences in behavior. And we can ask what seems like a, to me, a, a really simple and maybe a little bit of a stupid question, but surprisingly nobody had done it before. Um, are there differences in brain anatomy across dog breeds? Um, so to address this, um, we got a bunch of MRI scans from dogs that had um, shown up at a vet clinic at, U at UGA um, in Georgia, where I used to live. Um, they had shown up for neurological examinations, were referred for MRI scans, but turned out not to have any identifiable anatomical issue in the MRI scan. Um, so these are ostensibly healthy, normal dogs, although potentially maybe something a little weird about some of them. Um, so uh, we pulled all of those scans off the scanner and then separated out all the dogs that we knew were purebred. Um, so this is an image just of a mid-sagittal section um, from a selection of these scans. That there are some just sort of blatantly obvious differences in the sort of overall shape of the brain and maybe in some of its internal components. Um, well, one thing that stands out a lot is that dogs that have small heads, like small body sizes, um, their brains are more globular um, and are really packed into the skull. There's like barely any space in there for anything except for brain. And it almost looks like, you know, the brain is stuffed in there. Um, on the other hand, if you look at dogs that are bigger, have bigger heads and um, bigger bodies, 
um, there's a lot of space around the brain. Um, so if you have like a golden retriever um, or a border collie, you might be surprised to know that most, or maybe not most, but a good part of the space inside that dog's head is not brain, a good part of it's air. So if you have one of these dogs, you may or may not find that surprising. Um, so here on this next slide, I'm going to show these same scans, but um, in 3D renderings, and they're scaled to actual size. So you can see that there are some pretty stark differences in brain size, although they're not as big as the differences in body size. So a Yorkshire Terrier um, has a brain that's you know maybe half the size of a standard, standard poodle, but a Yorkshire Terrier is way smaller than half the size of a standard poodle. Um, and then if you if I rescale them again, so now they're all the same um, length, you can see that not only are the, there are these differences in size, but there may be some differences in the um, relative um, size and shape of components inside the brain. Um, so this image shows a map of variation similar to the map of variation I showed in the foxes. The green regions are more variable across the entire data set. Um, and then this is a statistical test um, to see if that variation is randomly distributed across the brain or if it's um, more significant in some parts of the brain than in others. And this was the case. Variation across the dog brain is not randomly distributed. Some regions are more variable than others. So this suggests that um, natural selection could have been acting on particular regions of the brain. Um, so to kind of dig into this further, we did the same type of analysis that we did with the Fox scans, um, where we used um, source-based morphometry, a form of independent components analysis to identify um, networks in the brain. So groups of regions whose anatomy co-varies with each other across the entire data set. And then we can ask what sort of factors might explain this variation. Um, so in addition to selection on behavior in different breeds, there's other things that could also produce Looks like her connection just cut out. Let's see if she's coming back in a second. Yes, I can see the slide, but I cannot hear. She's frozen on my screen. It sometimes happens with Zoom that you don't even realize yourself because you still oh, Maybe we can try, we can write, I don't know. I'm just trying to do that because this seems to be going on for a little. Oh, you're back. You're still on mute, hang on. Oh, can you hear me? We can hear you now. <laughs> Yeah, uh, so apparently I got disconnected. Um, what was the last thing you guys heard? Uh, that's the right slice. And basically the beginning of that slice is when you cut out. So okay, so uh, we did the same type of analysis that we did with the foxes, where we look for um, networks of brain regions whose anatomy co-varies across the entire data set. Um, and then once we identify those networks, we can ask what um, variables might explain the variation. So um, in addition to selection on behavior, we know that different breeds of dogs have also undergone different kinds of selection for other things. Um, for example, there are big differences in body size across dog breeds. So that's going to result in differences in brain size. Um, and when uh, the brain changes size evolutionarily, it does not um, change in lockstep. So all different regions change at different rates. So you could have differences in um, the internal anatomy of the brain um, that are re a result of scaling in brain size. Um, we also know that different breeds of dogs have been under selection for different skull shapes. So some, some breeds of dogs have these like really long pointy heads, others have these like more flat, smushed faces. So those differences in skull shape, it would stand to reason that they could produce differences in brain anatomy. Um, we could also have differences in brain anatomy across breeds due to genetic drift. So humans sort of consciously try to keep different breeds of dogs from interbreeding. So that's this whole idea of like purebred dogs. Um, and because of that, um, you could have big founder effects where um, random variation in the founding population for a particular breed could produce um, down the line, could produce differences in brain anatomy across breeds that are completely unrelated to behavior. It's just um, 
uh, random chance about um, differences in brain anatomy in the founding populations. So the sort of last thing that we were interested in uh, that we wanted to address is whether selection on behavior might have actually produced differences in brain anatomy. Um, so this next slide shows um, difference, these, these six networks that um, sort of uh, optimally describe variation in brain anatomy across the entire data set. So these are like uh, the six networks or the six dimensions along which brain anatomy can vary. Um, if you were kind of thinking about brain anatomy um, as an analog to a five factor in inventory for personality, these would be like the five factors, but instead we have six brain networks. Um, so the first network contains regions that are involved in uh, drive and reward processing. These are all members of the mesolimbic reward system. We have uh, the cingulate gyrus parts of prefrontal cortex, the nucleus accumbens, which is part of the ventral striatum, caudate. Um, so this, this network of brain regions might be involved in um, the experience of drive and motivating behavior to get a reward. Um, the second network contained um, cortical regions involved in olfactory and gustatory processing. So these are not, this is not the olfactory bulb. This is not the primary site of olfactory sensation in the brain. It's sort of a higher order region um, that might be involved in um, making decisions about um, what action should result from perceiving a particular odor. So that'll become important in a little bit. Um, the third network contains regions of the brain involved in movement, eye movement, and spatial navigation. Um, the fourth network has regions that are involved in social action and interaction. These regions are um, active when dogs see or hear dogs or humans in an fMRI scanner. Um, this chorion gyrus was also affected in selection in the Fox Farm experiment. The fifth network um, contains uh, hypothalamus, amygdala, and hippocampus. Um, these regions are involved in flight or fight processing or like stress and anxiety. These networks were also affected in the Fox Farm experiment. Um, and then finally, the sixth network has um, early olfactory and visual regions. Okay, so now we know um, how and where brain anatomy varies across dogs, and we can ask what accounts for this variation. Um, so um, in the paper, um, we talk about, um, we, we report some analyses looking at uh, brain size and brain shape. I won't go into those here, um, but I will show our analysis to see whether founder effects might have had a, a big effect here. Um, so if it is the case that um, early um, sort of progenitors of groups of breeds um, had a random variation in brain anatomy that translated um, into the current day, we should be able to trace phylogenetic signal um, through the, the dog family tree um, with relation to these, these six networks. And that is not the case. You can't use the dog phylogenetic tree um, to predict factor loadings for each individual breed on each of these six networks. In fact, it seems to be pretty random. Um, so uh, this is um, evidence for strong recent specific selection in individual breeds rather than um, early effects, you know, further back in the dog phylogenetic tree. Um, so then we can ask the interesting question whether this variation is linked to the behavioral specializations of different breeds, um, and it appears to be the case. Um, so for example, um, in uh, dog breeds that um, their primary historical function was just companionship, so like lap dogs, um, their strongest association was with the spring network involved in social action and interaction. Um, for um, breeds that were developed for bird flushing and retrieving, um, and also for sight hunting, their strongest um, association is with this network of brain regions involved in movement, eye movement, and spatial navigation. So you can think if your job is to watch something moving across the environment, get yourself to that thing and then bring it back, um, that those brain regions might be important. Um, for uh, breeds developed for scent hunting, their strongest association is with this um, higher order olfactory network. So not not um, whether or not a scent is present, but what you should do, potentially what you should do with the knowledge that that scent is present. Um, and then breeds developed for sport fighting, um, their strongest association is with this network um, implicated in fear, stress, and anxiety. Um, so uh, an interesting thing here is that as far as we know, all of the 
dogs that were in this study were not working dogs. They're just um, companion animals, pets. Um, so what we're looking at here is um, anatomical differences that result from generations of selection on behavior rather than um, the individual going through some kind of experience with that behavior in its own lifetime. So heritable effects, not plastic effects. Um, so in our, our current study, which was being led by Sophie Barton, a grad student in my lab, um, we're trying to disentangle these heritable effects from these experience-driven effects. So we're recruiting um, actively working dogs um, that are in the real world, doing their job, they're good at their job. Um, and then also um, litter mate or blood relative um, control dogs that um, had, you know, came from the same lines, perhaps had some early exposure to this task, um, but for whatever reason, just became companion animals. So an example would be like a um, border collie who's winning herding championships and then his couch potato brother. So um, the idea is that uh, by looking at brain anatomy across um, these different conditions, we'll be able to disentangle um, what features a brain organization result from selection um, in the lineage leading to that dog versus what uh, features of brain anatomy result from experience and training. Um, okay, so uh, I'll, I guess I'll pause for a moment again, um, and I, I know we're getting close to time here, so I, I might either zoom through or even just skip the, the third component, depending on what Stephanie thinks. Uh, do you just want to do the third one, and then we do all the questions in one sure. go? Okay, we can do that. Um, okay. So um, the, the third thing I was gonna talk about is um, general temperament. So different breeds of dogs have been selected, not just for these sort of instrumental working behaviors, but also kind of personality traits like aggression, um, different types of anxiety, separation behavior, trainability, energy level, and so forth. Um, these things are commonly measured with an instrument called the Canine Behavioral Assessment and Research Questionnaire or CBARC. Um, and this, this survey has been given to owners of dogs, thousands and thousands of dogs from hundreds of breeds. So this is a, a really highly um, validated um, instrument that has resulted in sort of a breed average phenotype in each of these dimensions of behavior. So we used these breed average temperamental phenotypes, you know, breed average scores for each of these CBAR categories and asked how they mapped on to the same data that I just talked about from the last study. Um, so for this, we used uh, another voxel-based morphometry analysis, a model-driven analysis where we asked um, where uh, gray matter um, volume um, is uh, larger or smaller in relation to scores on each of these dimensions of behavior. So this, um, this slide is really busy and that's on purpose because um, I think that the main point is that the, um, the actual uh, neuroanatomy here doesn't matter very much. Um, and the reason is that um, it appears that all of this can be explained by a, a sort of overarching um, phenomenon. So if you look at all of these sort of like what you would call problem behaviors, aggression, um, separation problems, um, dogs being overexcitable, uh, fear issues, and so forth. They all generally involve reductions in cortex. So that's what's indicated by the blue. Um, on the other hand, trainability um, is associated with expansion in cortex, um, indicated by red here. Um, and if you do an analysis where you just ask uh, how brain regional brain anatomy varies with overall brain size, you get pretty much the same pattern of results. Um, so dogs with bigger brains have more cortex, dogs with, uh, and dogs with bigger brains also have smaller subcortical regions. Um, so there's sort of an equal and opposite um, pattern of results here. So to quantify that, we used something called the dice coefficient, which is a, a me measure of the amount of spatial overlap between um, different sets of results. Um, so brain regions that are expanded, um, if the brain is bigger, um, are positively associated with trainability. Um, drain, brain regions that are um, reduced, um, if uh, the brain is bigger, those are positively associated with anxiety, aggression, and other sort of behavior problems. 
So just to kind of illustrate that um, in a different way, there's there's really there is no overlap between these two things. They're mutu mutually exclusive sets of brain regions. So this suggests a neuroanatomical trade-off. On the one hand, um, we see um, larger brains being associated with uh, more cortex, increased trainability, and reduced anxiety and aggression. On the other hand, smaller brains are associated with less cortex, reduced trainability, and increased anxiety and aggression. Um, so, um, and if you, if you actually do an analysis where you control for brain size, most of these results actually go away. So what this suggests is that total brain size is a major determinant of variation in temperament across dog breeds. Um, and this actually um, links really, really well with prior behavioral research, which has found that body size is um, a primary explanatory factor in uh, breed differences in behavior. So there was one study that used these CWARC scores from 32,000 dogs of 82 different breeds um, and if you do a clustering analysis on them, um, the scores cluster together more on the dog's um, body height than on breed relatedness. Um, also, breed differences in CBARC scores are linked to IGF-1, which is a determinant of body size. Um, we've done some additional analyses that are under review now, um, linking IGF-1 to um, these differences in regional brain anatomy and some of those six networks that I know talked about earlier. Um, and also IGF-1 uh, was just the focus of a paper that I think came out today about uh, body size scaling in dogs relative to wolves um, and this genetic variant having been present um, in the wolf ancestor of dogs. So these MRI results offer a neuroanatomical neuro explanation for these like really well established behavioral results um, linking body size and um, behavior. So what might be going on here? Um, on a sort of approximate level, um, you could think that um, everything that we think of as like a problem behavior in dogs has to do with emotional reactivity, anxiety, aggression, um, problems with separation, being overly excitable. Those are basically the dog just experiencing and expressing its emotions in ways that are inconvenient for humans. Um, on the other hand, trainability is sort of the opposite thing. Um, it's the dog learning to control its behavior in the way that the human wants. Um, so these sort of um, impulsive, maybe instinctual, emotional behaviors that we might kind of cluster together under reactivity are probably controlled by subcortical circuits. Um, and then trainability or the sort of uh, behavioral flexibility and willful control of behavior probably relies heavily on cortex. So on approximate level, that might explain why we've got this trade-off between cortical expansion um, and uh, subcortical expansion linked to these different behavior categories. But what if we like really want a more explanation, more mechanistic explanation? So this is where um, Barbara Frenlay's work comes back up again. Um, if you look broadly across animal species, um, you can predict uh, differences in brain anatomy to a large degree just by differences in overall brain size. So if you know um, the total brain volume of a particular unknown species, you can predict the volume of each of the components inside the brain within a range of about two or 3%. Um, and the reason for this is that there are developmental linkages um, across brain regions, but you know, kind of cause them to, to develop um, in concert rather than um, independently for the most part. So these relationships scale non-linearly with increases in total brain size. Um, and larger brains have proportionally more cortex and proportionally less um, subcortical regions. So this is just sort of a general feature of brain evolution um, in comparative neuroscience. Um, it has really been really well documented in a cross-species context. So now we're seeing it in a within-species context where members of the species have undergone differential selection on body size. Um, so brain morphology um, and CBARC scores are very tightly linked to total brain size, not because, you know, bigger dogs have bigger brains and more brain equals smarter dog, but because shifts with total brain size cause shifts in the relative size of different regions, in particular, uh, relative enlargement of cortex and um, sort of a proportionally less subcortical region. So this might drive this sort of um, increase in controlled, trainable behavior and reduction in reactive, emotion-driven behavior. Um, so um, I think there are some implications here for dogs. Um, 
we might it might be the case that um, selection on particular regions or circuits could drive concerted enlargement of the entire brain. Um, uh, another possibility is that problem behaviors like anxiety and aggression and so forth that are measured by CBARC um, are just less um, less tolerable in larger breed dogs and in smaller breed dogs. Um, so it might be that you know having an aggressive Chihuahua is annoying, but it's not a serious problem. Having an aggressive German Shepherd is a serious problem. So maybe uh, larger breed dogs have undergone stronger selection against what humans see as problem behaviors. Um, Another potential implication is that we know that body size and brain size are themselves linked. So because we're seeing this difference between, or this link with neural phenotype being linked to body size, um, it might be the case that particular behavioral phenotypes are only evolvable in dogs of a particular body size, because you just can't have that neural phenotype in a dog of a different body size. Um, I think there might also be some implications here for humans. Um, so in humans, uh, and in the primate uh, lineage leading to humans, um, we know that brain size expansion occurs disproportionately in association regions of cortex. So these are parts of cortex that are um, kind of more at the top of sensory processing hierarchies and integrate um, sensory information from multiple domains, are more in involved in things that we might call complex cognition. Um, so there's this uh, tethering hypothesis from Randy Buckner and Fenna Creenan which proposes that um, this ex expansion of the brain has um, produced increased association regions, which because they are so far removed from early sensory processing of hierarchies, um, they've become sort of untethered from the feed forward or hardwired circuit organization that would have been typical of ancestral mammals. So these regions of the brain are basically open for business, open for plasticity, adaptation, and so forth. Um, and this is where culturally learned skills for which human brains are adapted, like language and tool use, um, make their home in the brain. So these sort of brain scaling um, effects um, could, have, could have been an important feature in human evolution as well, um, as it relates to expansion of association regions and then emergence of the types of behaviors that rely on association regions, like language. Um, to, so to give a sort of overall summary, I think um, this work together has um, implications for what happens to a brain when it undergoes domestication. Um, also, I think um, this type of research can help us understand um, real world dog behavior and potentially real world dog training. Um, and then there are some implications for understanding human brain evolution. Um, I talked a little bit about domestication. I didn't really um, jump into the self-domestication hypothesis, but I think um, in order to evaluate whether humans have undergone anything like domestication in our own evolutionary history, we need to know what happens in the brains of species that we know are actually domesticated. So um, I think this is an important first step in addressing that hypothesis. Um, and then I think that this type of work can also tell us how brains evolve adaptations for skills that you have to learn. Um, so, for example, um, livestock herding by border collies relies heavily on learning. Um, so uh, border collies are born with uh, an innate predisposition to be interested in sheep, to want to chase sheep and chase other things, um, but they don't become champion herders without a lot of training and learning. So I think this might have some parallels um, with uh, evolutionary um, patterns that have occurred in the human brain. Um, our brains clearly have some sort of innate predisposition to learn language. Um, human babies learn language without explicit instruction. It sort of happens um, easily and naturally, which suggests that our brains are pre-wired in some way to learn language, but um, language doesn't get in our brains without learning. So we have innate adaptations for acquiring learned skills. I think we can learn about the mechanisms that produce those by studying dogs. And I think maybe the most, um, interesting thing that uh, has popped out of this that it is maybe the most surprising thing is that brain evolution can happen really fast. So in the Russian fox farm experiment, we're looking at about 60 generations right now of um, the selection pressure. And we see um, significant differences in neuroanatomy within that time frame. So this, this is surprising. Um, I also wanted to thank our um, Veterinary collaborators, we wouldn't be able to do this without their help. I'm not operating out of a vet school. I'm operating out of a human neuroimaging facility. 
Um, so we really rely on them. Um, and we need more help of this kind. So if there are any vet people um, out in the audience, um, we're looking for more um, veterinary technicians and anesthesiologists to help us support dog MRI scans in the Boston area. Um, if anybody has um, archived normative MRI scans from dogs that they might be willing to share, um, we can add to our data set and do more analyses. Um, we're also constantly looking for people that um, have working dogs or that are involved in training working dogs um, and vet practices that may be interested in brain tissue donation after euthanasia, um, we, can, we can gain knowledge from, from that tissue. Um, if you're interested in getting involved in this work, we have a, a few at home like citizen science studies that we came up with during the pandemic. Um, so people can do experiments with their dogs at home, take video, send it to us, we'll analyze it. Right now we're looking at um, how dogs use their paws to interact with objects, how dogs, dogs use their faces to communicate with people and uh, vocalization um, in response to different types of auditory stimuli, uh, particularly with howling. So you can find out about that in our website. Um, and yeah, I'd also like to thank my collaborators and uh, my funding and uh, thank you all for listening and I'd be happy to take any questions. Amazing. Thank you so much. That was a lovely talk. Um, there was a lot of communication going on in the background. So I have a long list of questions, um, but let's uh, let people start uh, here in the audience. The first hand is up. I can see Leah. Hi, yes, this, um, I have a lot of questions about this, the last part about dogs. Uh, one, I was really impressed when you showed the images of the brain anatomy in dogs. Uh, I was wondering if there are also differences between uh, gerifications also across the different uh, brain size and also in lateralization. So all the questions that we uh, do for human brain anatomy, I was thinking uh, uh, for dog, if uh, these questions are addressed uh, or, or not, or there are like no differences, I don't know. Um, so I think one part of this question was lateralization. We're looking at this now. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, we're, we're kind of in the midst of analysis right now. Um, and then, uh, I, I'm sorry, what were the other things that you asked about? Uh, the different gerifications. Yes, that it's also linked to them. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, we haven't studied that yet. It would be a fascinating thing to study. Um, there were a pair of researchers by the last name of Radinsky um, in the 70s who did a lot of work on gyrification and sulfur patterns um, across canid species and carnivore species um, in the archaeological paleoarchaeological record. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they found some some interesting effects. So yeah, it would be interesting to look at that in domestic dog breeds. Yes, yes, uh, it's really, and also I wrote another um, question uh, on the chat about the Jowing. I never know how to pronounce it. So there was this article published uh, in uh, uh, recently about the correlation about Jowing. Is it correct, Jowing? When you do and the brain sizes, Stephanie, help me. I think you mean yawning, right? Yawning, yes. Ah. And brain, yeah, and brain sizes. So I was uh, wondering if there is also this difference in uh, dogs also related to sleep habits, uh, if there are different, uh, uh, could that also could relate with um, the, the brain size. Yeah, great question. Um, we initially, when we started doing behavior testing with dogs in the lab, um, we had a, a yawning paradigm that was part of it. Um, so uh, dogs are reported to catch yawns contagiously from humans. We were unable to replicate replicate this in the lab, so we dropped that from the behavior study. Okay. Um, but yeah, that that would be interesting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. No, my hands are up, so I can go through my list. Uh, thank you so much. I'll be signing up, Atos, for sure, for your at-home studies. Um, right, so we had one comment over on YouTube from Susanna Shex saying that if you are interested in the Fox Project, there's also a great book, audio book called How to Tame a Fox and Build a Dog. The reference is on YouTube and over here in the chat. So just to uh, put that out there. Um, then let me start with a few practical questions. So how do you train the dog to go into the MRI and how long does that take? Ah, so we actually don't, we just sedate them. Um, 
So okay. we have, uh, yeah, we have expert veterinary staff um, and uh, it doesn't take very long. You know, the scan doesn't take very long, so. So all these studies were done in sleeping dogs, not yep. awake. Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Correct. Yeah. So, you know, we're just looking at brain anatomy. So the dog doesn't need to be awake. Um, that way they don't experience any stress. Um, they don't move in the scanner. Yeah. Fantastic. Then another practical question that came up in the chat is, should I get a brain scan before I get the dog? <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, why not? <laughs> Getting a brain scan is fun. Um, <laughs> yes, it's not easy to get a scan of your dog's brain just for the fun of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, another practical question. So you, you showed this anatomical trade-off about uh, bigger dog breeds having bigger brains, having more cortex and vice versa, smaller brains uh, in lead to dogs or are correlated with dogs being slightly more aggressive. So is it fair to say that for beginners in the pandemic, a lot of people are newbies to getting a dog. If you are a beginner, a bigger dog is probably easier or better for you than a smaller one. Yeah, uh, great question. I hesitate to give advice because I would hate to give the wrong advice. Uh, my experience with big dogs is, you know, I, like my hands-on experience with big dogs is that they are more trainable and less reactive. Um, maybe, you know, try to spend some time with the dog and um, maybe foster it for a week before you make sure it's a good fit for you. One thing is that if a big dog, like I said, if a big dog has a problem, it's a big problem. If a small dog has a problem, it's a small problem. Yeah, I, I cover all the data. <laughs> right, a uh, couple of questions from uh, YouTube that we got. Um, the first one, what can the selective rather than the natural evolution of certain traits in dogs uh, tell us about CRISPR and other gene editing technologies which could possibly be applicable for humans? Hmm, okay, so if I understand the question correctly, you're asking about naturally occurring selection processes which change, you know, the genome through through evolution versus technological manipulations of the genome like CRISPR and, you know, how are those things different? So one thing that um, is going on in evolution is that evolution never really acts on just one thing at once. Um, it's acting on multiple things simultaneously. Um, there might be conflicting selection pressures that are kind of duking it out in terms of which gets control of a trait. Um, and uh, for something like CRISPR, it, you know, it's, it's a laser focused, really clean um, alteration of a particular gene. Um, that might also result in downstream effects um, on multiple aspects of the organism's behavior or physiology because most genes don't just do one thing. Um, but yeah, uh, I think maybe the, the question, the answer is that they, they, they will, they are different. They work in different ways. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, the next question, if a certain dog was trained and used for behavioral specialization that it had not evolved for, could its neuroanatomy change to fit that specialization? Yeah, I think so. Um, so we're looking at that right now. Um, so uh, historically, Labrador retrievers and golden retrievers were selected for this um, bird flushing and retrieval function. Um, but now they're being used um, as seeing eye dogs and as um, assistance dogs for people in wheelchairs. So we're studying um, these dogs to try to understand um, whether this new wave of selection pressure is producing differences relative to the sort of ancestral um, bird hunting function. Great. And then one question that was over here on Zoom in the chat. So I don't know if Katja, Roberto, if you want to jump into this discussion, but the question was, or the comment, guarding, protecting sentinel breeds, go low on every single component. M maybe that makes them more violent. Just a wild guess. Uh, so, sorry, could you repeat that? Sure. Guarding, protecting sentinel breeds, score low on every single component. Maybe that makes them more violent. Oh, um, uh, there we go. Roberto's jumping in. <laughs> yeah. Hi. 
It, it, it's the, the the matrix you showed at some point with the different components and the different right. and and it was kind of surprising to see that there, there was a, a a row where everything was blue. Well, probably there had to be one where everything was blue, and it happened to be <laughs> this one. I don't know if it's for a reason or it's just random. It might be because we didn't have enough individuals from the, that breed group in the analysis. So um, it could be that there are relationships with some of those uh, brain networks, but we were unable to detect them. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think there's a lot of open questions here. This is just, you know, the, the first initial study identifying breed differences in neuroanatomy. I think there's a lot left to learn and um, our data set was opportunistic. Um, so they're, they're, it's not the perfect data set. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then a uh, final question for me. So you showed those um, six uh, brain networks in, in one of the early slides. Um, and I was surprised that there was no network for learning or trainability on that particular slide. It came later on when you mm -hmm. showed the, the correlations. And I was wondering, how that is possible because like the most prominent thing we humans interact or do with dogs when we interact is to teach them how to behave to teach tricks how to work so how come there is no specification in their brain for it yeah so i think two things one um, i just want to clarify that the labels that i put on those networks were my interpretation of what those brain regions might be doing what the analysis gives us is the groups of brain regions. And then I kind of named them by, you know, through knowledge of what, what those brain regions do in dogs and in other species. Um, so it's possible that, you know, one or more of those networks is involved in trainability. Um, another thing, another possibility is that the second dog study I talked about, it looks like trainability is um, linked just very generally with overall cortical expansion. Um, so more cortex, more trainability. It doesn't seem to be specifically localized into, you know, one particular region of cortex. So um, I don't think that result could have possibly come out of the mathematical analysis that we did that produced the six networks. Fair enough. And then very final question for me, last chance for everyone else to raise their hand here. Um, do you know that saying, you can't teach an old dog new tricks? Did you look at age effects? Is that, is that actually true? Uh, so dogs are actually used as a model of human aging in brain research because they develop plaques um, as they get older, um, which is a, something that's associated with um, age-related cognitive decline in humans. Um, and there is like doggy dementia is a thing. Um, you can get drugs for it from your vet. Like there are approved drugs, drugs to treat this. Um, uh, we did not look at age in our analysis. Um, I imagine that we would see differences in brain anatomy with age, which would probably kind of parallel what you see in humans. I'm guessing that you would see general reductions in gray matter with age. Um, mm -hmm. As the owner of an old dog who um, is 15 years old, I think you can still teach, train them new tricks. Um, they get a little bit more ornery and grumpy about it as time goes on, but I think they maintain the ability to learn. Very true. Um... There is one more question that came in through the chat. Would it be possible to check for activation of brain regions during certain behaviors to see if bigger sized regions also correlate with bigger activity? Yeah, so the challenge there is how do you measure behavior in a dog um, while you're imaging brain activity? So if you stick the dog in the fMRI scanner, you know, with a lot of training, you can get, you can get them to go in an MRI scanner and be awake and respond to stimuli, but um, getting them to behave, particularly in a sort of naturalistic, ecologically valid way, um, that could be challenging. There are other types of brain imaging um, that allow you to look at activity that occurs outside the scanner. One of those is FDG PET. Um, so this is a, a type of research that um, I and other researchers um, have used in the past to look at naturally occurring behavior in chimpanzees. Um, so I think uh, if or when we move to um, looking at brain activation, we'll probably be doing it with PET, which is a really old methodology, but um, it will let us look at like uh, naturalistically occurring behavior. Mm 
Fantastic. Thank you so, so much. Um, there's a lot of praise for your talk over on YouTube, if you want to check that out later. For everyone else here on Zoom and over on YouTube, thank you so much for joining us. This was, as I said, the first talk of our new season for 2022. Usually these are on Thursdays. We just had to move this one. Um, it's usually the last Thursday of the month um, at 4 p.m. Paris time. And the next one will be on the 24th of February with the catchy title, Being Awake While Asleep, Being Asleep While Awake. And I hope we see you there. Thank you so much and have a lovely weekend, everyone. Bye. Thank you all.